<laughs> we are back! Oh my gosh, we're back with another awesome video here. Paleocrat Diaries. Uh, how do you like that music? <laughs> I'm keeping with the tradition. Listen to this. Oh, just crank it up. Hold on. We're just going to enjoy this. Hold on. I need to learn how to sing this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Ah, again, Paleocrat Diaries. Your host, Jeremiah Bannister. We are live every Wednesday now over at Meaning of Catholic, the YouTube channel. And we're going to be doing these little videos like this. I promised, by the way, I would do this. And I made good on it. I'm trying real hard. I promised I'd make a video because I wasn't engaging so much in real time with the comments in the comment section. So remember, when you watch the live show, and I'll try to do better about engaging in real time with the comments and stuff, but but when you're watching the live show, make sure, post a comment, make it good. Make it, you know, if you want to make it nice and sweet, cherry on top, you might find it landed in one of these videos here. But either which way, we're going to get started. No further ado, folks. No further ado. All right, first of all, so two comments right out of the gate that I have to say, uh, it's good to have you back. This is Anderson Bush, and I'm glad Meaning of Catholic is taking it to the next level. And let me say this. They're not just taking it to the next level. They're cranking that bad boy up to, you know, 11. <laughs> They're cranking it up to 11. You've got Tim Flanders. You've got Kennedy Hall, and you've got moi. And so it's, <laughs> it's a juggernaut, man. It is a juggernaut. Kennedy Hall, speaking of, Kennedy Hall said this. Jer Bear. Wait a second. <laughs> Jer Bear? What? Jer Bear, Kennedy, you might be the only man that I will ever allow <laughs> to call me Jer Bear. You get a pass, bro. You get a pass. In fact, it kind of is cool a little bit coming from you. <laughs> so Jer Bear, call into Crusade later. I'm going to talk about similar things, talking about media theory. We could use your insight. And by the way, I was on Crusade, the uh, Crusade channel with Kennedy, and it was an awesome time. In fact, I was there... I think altogether, almost an hour. Almost an hour. It was a great time. I anticipate being on again. Uh, the invitation's been out there for me to be on, well, in fact, multiple times if I would like. And, of course, I most certainly would. I got to meet Mike Church, right? I got to meet him. You know, uh, Kennedy, it's no fault of his own. He's like, you've done some AM, you know, some radio stuff. I'm like, man, I've done AM, FM radio since I was like 15 years old. <laughs> I've done it almost all my life, man. I'll go ahead and post the link in the description below. It may be even as a pinned comment down in the comment section. Make sure, of course, add comments below and you might find yourself on one of our comment videos. All right, next up, Colton Height. Hope I'm pronouncing this right. Okay, I've been in tears just hearing about your story. I have to see this video you were talking about. Is there a link? Yes, there is a link. I, it's been private, to be honest about it. It's been private. And, and I kind of... The original idea was that nobody would really see it. It would just be friends and family. But I think that I think that there are certain people that I'm okay with seeing that. And and they, they've been intrigued, not just intrigued by the story and fascinated by the story, but deeply moved by the story. And a lot of our friends, I mean, we, we consider them members of the family at this point. They're, they're part of Team Tiny Dancer forever. And so those individuals uh, would be able to see it. And so you can reach out to me, jeremiah.bannister at gmail.com or of course paleocrat diaries at gmail.com uh is it goozle 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 how would you, you know, what is that happy birthday angela talking about my wife and she most certainly did have a happy birthday even had some ice cream from jersey junction jeremiah bannister one of the few people that can make me laugh hysterically and weep in a short period of time heavenly birthday what a beautiful way to put it i'll keep praying for you and your beautiful family that fiesta music is hilarious and there's a whole bunch of these like emojis and stuff <laughs> and a little face a little one with the, with the x's and the eyeballs and stuff you know so yes the fiesta music wasn't it fitting wasn't it just appropriate kind of like the music at the beginning of this video i'm gonna have fun with it but i'll tell you uh that's something i've heard actually a lot is that the show is able to make people laugh because it's a little insane it's a little off the charts but also serious and and sometimes even sad um and, and hopeful too, motivational. And so that's, you're not the first person. In fact, the introduction that I got uh, when I spoke at the, uh, on the steps of the Capitol here in Lansing, 
it was the the last time I did that was Christmas of 2020. And when I did that, I was introduced by the person leading the event there. And she said she said something similar in front of a lot of people. And so that's something something I've heard, but I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful that you listen. And I'm grateful that you were were blessed by this show. All right, now this is a real deal. I promised Eric S. I don't even know who Eric S. is. But I promised Eric S. that I would go ahead and respond to this. He posted this in the the show that I was on with Kennedy and Tim, right? The three of us, the trifecta. And he posted this in the comments. And I tried to I tried to respond to people in the comments. I don't know if you noticed that or not. I tried to respond in the comments section as well as, of course, here. But I didn't want to respond to this one in the comments. I wanted to be able to, to highlight it in a video. But he's saying, when you diss on Lincoln, just remember something. The pre-Civil War ideas of limited reach of the federal government and states' rights were championed by those who never wanted there to be any great challenge to some men having their power to keep other men in chains and to separate families and to sell mothers away on an auction block while their children were watching. Um, There's a lot to go into this, by the way. I should do an entire show on it. I should. I should do an entire show on on the topic of of black people in the United States, the history of slavery, the biblical view of slavery, the historic uh, view that Catholics have maintained regarding slavery. Um, in fact, the South and what the popes, <laughs> the way, what did the popes think of the South, right? What did the reigning pontiff at the time think of the South? Did the, did the pontiff ever write a letter, by the way? Did they ever write a letter to anybody about it? You know, we should talk about that. But I have a lot of reasons to diss on Lincoln. Uh, I, I would encourage people, I mean this, I would encourage people to check out this book right here. Myths of American Slavery. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's backward. <laughs> it's backward. Because I have I have the, the, the screen reversed so that I can look over to the side. It looks better when I do that. It's okay. You, you, got, you caught me, guys. <laughs> Myths of American Slavery by Walter Kennedy. Forward by Bob Harrison. Right? Black Confederate guy. So going through this and, and the summation of this, I mean, it's an excellent book, well documented, but it says right here, with the introduction of federal censorship of the males, the arbitrary military arrest of civilians, the illegal suspension of habeas corpus, the suspension of elected legislatures, the jailing of political opponents, and the total abridgment of the First Amendment right of the press, Lincoln gave the United States its first real taste of civil slavery since the expulsion of King George's army. Yes. Yes. And that's, and that's, that's a short list. <laughs> that's a short list of some serious problems that went on. And, and I, got, I have to say this too, okay? The champions of this. Um, a lot of the people that were champions of this were the same ones that were kind of um, kept away, kept, <laughs> kept at bay from the convention by the Philadelphia lawyers. The scoundrels of the coup that went on. If you want to use, if you want to use... Dr. Gary North's analysis of this from political polytheism, which I think is excellent. Uh, I would love to to hear what I've asked before what Timothy Gordon thinks about it. He didn't answer, but he may not have heard when I asked it. I One of the first episodes we were ever on together at the same time. And I have a great amount of respect uh, for my friend, uh, Timothy Gordon. I love the guy, love his family, great dude. Um, but I'm not sure I agree with him. I am, however, reading Catholic Republic. I've been reading it for a minute. I, I read too many books at the same time. Um, you know, but it's one of those things where a lot of those individuals were kept from the convention, right? They were kept from the convention by the, who Gary North calls the Philadelphia lawyers. He, he insists that it's a coup. He breaks down why it's a coup. Okay. And how they were responsible. They were in fact guilty of many of the exact same things that the declaration accused King George of being guilty of. You tell me, you tell me. And on top of that, on top of that. If we're honest about it, there was a disproportionate number of Freemasons involved in that. And so you want to talk about who championed certain things <laughs> at the convention, and they're talking about a Freemasonic Republic. I'm sorry to tell you. And it's just what that is. I mean, if you're down with that, you're down with that. I mean, look, if you, if you want to argue it on the merits and not based on who the founders were themselves, you want to base it instead of the, because hidden in here, by the way, hidden in here is a, a pretty nasty little logical fallacy, Okay. You're going against the man is what you're doing. It's an ad hominem, bro. It's an ad hominem. You're saying some of the people that were that supported that, some of the people that are in the Hallmark cases 
for what's called free speech now are pornographers and Klansmen. <laughs> so cut it out, man. Cut it out, bro. The the uh, ACLU. You down with that? One of the biggest champions of modern free speech. You down with that? I don't know. I mean, maybe. Maybe he is. It says LBJ passed the civil rights and voting right laws with Republican votes in Congress. And then somehow in like a six month period in 1968, the great switcheroo happened. Black Southerners all became Democrats and white Southerners all became Republicans. Whoop dee doo. <laughs> Whoop dee doo. Whoop dee doo. There's a good argument to be made again about what is the intention. If you want to say, look, they don't like how we abuse the Constitution. They don't like how we add things to it willy nilly and that we decide to expand on powers without the consent of all the, you know, all the different states and the process that the Constitution declares it must go through in order for something of that magnitude to happen. And you may, you may think that that's perfectly fine, the expansion of, of democracy in this equalitarian wonderland we're living in now. And if you don't think that the cuckoo craziness that we're experiencing right now is connected to that, that's la la land. I don't mean to be rude, Eric. Yes. Come on, brother. Come on, man. It doesn't matter. It's kind of like saying, well, you know, well, we we know we know if you really wanted to vote vote for somebody who's not racist, you just got to vote for like Hillary and stuff because they support Hillary by like a ninety five percent margin, <laughs> or eighty five percent. And that's that's it's more than that. Let's say ninety. Let's just call it a even Stephen, right? Ninety. Ninety percent would support, let's say, Hillary Clinton. Has Hillary Clinton said anything, by the way, about some black people? Let me just ask you that. Is that a good? Is that is that the the way that we should determine whether or not something is right or wrong? And don't you think that there are other values at stake? That even though there may be an overlap, that some are more important than others. And in fact, take this as an example. Some people might say, "I support free speech, but I don't support pornography." But you know what? If you're in the free speech world at this point in American history, you are going to be in the same world as that. You are. Am I going to say that you, you're into gangbang porn because of that? You support gangbang porn. No. I'm going to say you have an idea about what freedom of speech is. And they have an idea. And because of circumstances, it over, it, there's an overlap of that. I'd say the same thing here. I'd say the same thing here. And I look at it like this. I say, look, I don't mean to be rude about this. And people can get on my case. They can say, well, that sounds racist. <laughs> they can do that all day long. But if, if you look at, at the political opinion and the, the, the political dynamic and even the group dynamics of black people in the United States, extraordinarily ethnocentric, way more ethnocentric than, than let's say, white Caucasians, right? Indo-Europeans, way more. Way, 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 way more. They're like, they're up there with the Jews <laughs> for crying out loud with ethnocentrism. Okay. In fact, they're, with, they're up there with every other hyphenated group for that matter. And you look and you say, what are, what are the reasons for, for their political f affiliations? Are they, are they voting, by the way, are they voting in Detroit or in Chicago? Are they voting the way that they're voting because it's honestly in their best interest to keep voting for Democrats? Can you say that with a straight face? And if someone says, what, are you saying that they're misinformed? I'd say overwhelmingly. <laughs> Over, I'm not going to shy from that. Funny enough, Trump was right when he said, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose, right? What did they have to lose? They, and, and they had more jobs. They had more jobs. They had, they had more money, more home ownership, less jail time. And what happens? Vote for Biden. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, you, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sit there and defend that, bro. So I don't look at that and say, "Oh man, look at that. That's a real telling sign." No, it's not. No, it's not. There's a there's a large number of reasons. And and during that time, what else was going on culturally, man? What else was going on culturally? There was a big switcheroo, wasn't there? There was a big switcheroo with the Democratic Party on some of their positions, on some of their social positions, not just not just race. But I appreciate it. And look, you give, you give something that's deeper. You might not like my answer. I'm assuming you won't, Eric S. You can write a blog about it. <laughs> write a blog about it. Tell me how I'm wrong. Tell me how I'm wrong, man. Tell all your friends. Share this video and tell them 
that I'm very misinformed and I'm leading people astray. Do it. Let everybody know. Make it go viral. <laughs> Please, actually. You know, but if you if you write a good comment, I'll talk about it. I'll talk about it. Okay, so here we are. Oh, question. Okay, what do you think of Tim Gordon's view that America is a crypto Catholic republic? Um, I don't think it's as strong as so far. Okay, admittedly, I'm not entirely all the way through. I think there's some issues with it. Okay, but I would respectfully disagree without questioning his intelligence on this. He's extraordinarily intelligent on this. But so is for, and I'm only using this as an example. So is Dr. Gary North. So is Dr. Gary North. And Dr. Gary North, his background talking about um, talking about the the education of the founders, the kind of Newtonian theology that they had back then, the the role of Freemasonry at the time. I think that's downplayed. And I think you can only go so far by saying, well, it's a certain kind of Freemasonry. I don't it, it doesn't go very far with me, man. However, he says, I somehow agree that Jefferson's minimum government is compatible with subsidiarity. Yes, I think that Jefferson's idea of minimum government can be uh, um, compatible with subsidiarity. I think that you can see this fleshed out, not exactly the same. In fact, it'd be like a later version of Jefferson um, with the the rebel agrarians, the 12 Southerners, right? I'll take my stand uh, and um, who owns America? And actually, um, you know, you end up having... Uh, Hillary Belloc, who wrote in Who Owns America? And so he has he has a, sec- a segment of that book. Uh, it's, ex- it's exceptionally good and definitely compatible with subsidiarity. Uh, the trick, but I, I, I need to say this though. I have a view of subsidiarity that's a little bit different. Okay, I wrote over at the Distributist Review and I'm no longer a hardline distributist. I'm heavily influenced by it, but I'm not a hardliner on that. Um, but I used to be a contributing editor for the Distributist Review. I'm the one who took the pictures at the debate with Novak and Stork and the the uh, solidar- the guy who was defending solidarism. So I was there for that. But I, I wrote about it because I don't take the position that if a smaller, if, if, if a group closer to home can do it, it should be done at home. Because you can make the argument that it can be and you're going to debate over whether or not it can and to what extent it can. I think the church is much more nuanced than that with the idea, in a more complete view of subsidiarity that treats it spherically and that, that various spheres within society, that there's a balance of these spheres and that each one of those, you may have overlap, you may have an intersect, but by and large, there's uh, there are certain things, even insurance, for example, people can make the argument, well, private groups can do insurance. Yes, but the popes have said that that's something that the state, in fact, should be more involved with. So that's my view on it. We'll go, well, I'll talk about that more in different time. Let's see here. Okay. Wow. I got to get reading glasses on for this. Who is this? Camo Vets. That's kind of a cool name. All right. Love Jeremiah. He sees things very realistically. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. One point that wasn't brought up. How do we start Catholic communities when the church itself is now part of global homo? That's a tough one. (laughs) And, And well, for one, I don't believe it needs to be just uniquely Catholic. So I sit there and say, at this point, given the nature of the circumstance, at this point, we got to deal with the, the cards we're being dealt. We got to dance with whoever's beating down the door and dragging us to the ball. We got to dance this thing. And so I say, we have to be able to, to, to work alongside them, fighting a common enemy at the same time, keeping alive very, with, with a great amount of liveliness and strength. We need to keep alive those debates, those deep-rooted, heartfelt debates over disagreements, particularly about dogma. And that's that's where meaning of Catholic is definitely extremely valuable right now because it's so easy to just focus on the, the enemies at the gates and not realize that we also have to deal, whether it's separated brethren, right, of all the various shades, right, dealing with them as well as the enemies outside the gates. So we have, but, but they're not the exact same thing. And one is definitely a major time threat <laughs> right now, right now. And so I think that we need to be, we need to have strong parish communities. It's a good question though. Like, um, is it, is it helpful? And I, I'm, I'm interested in what you think on this. Is it helpful when Latin mass types all go to the Latin mass church and they don't go to their parish that they would normally go to, right? So the parish up the road, the traditional parish system. So you end up going there and you're creating kind of like 
ethnocentrism by default is going to create just a mere consequence of its existence. It is going to create a white block. So if you have uh, blacks over here and Mexicans over here and you have a Hispanic Latina and you've got Asians over here and you've got uh, Indians over here and you've got Muslims over here, you've got all the different groups, right, that are racially and ethnically divided up and, and they're all in different places. If it's like a bag of Skittles and you toss that bag of Skittles on the ground and you have or on a table and you've got all the different colors of people and you push them all into their different areas and the only ones that remain are the white ones, bada boom, bada bing, you have a white demographic. <laughs> That's white people. That's the white race at that point. Okay, even if, even if you didn't want to recognize that there was such a thing, you've literally just kind of created it. I think there's something similar that happens when, when trads go to, they, they drive a ways away. I do this. I do this. Drive a ways away to go to mass and my parish up the road is left to what? Traditional people are not leaven there at all. They're not leaven in those churches. So what do we have? We complain. It, it, it creates a divide. I think that's a discussion. I would like to actually have it. I think that it'd be a good discussion to have with, with Tim and with Kennedy. I think it'd be good for the three of us to talk about it because I think that there are things that, that at least need to be asked. I'm not saying that we should all go back to our, our, our nearest parish. At the same time, we need to be willing to say that there's a consequence to not doing so. There's no, there's no free lunches, folks. Uh, vanilla Americans <laughs> are extremely individualistic. Yes, Jonathan Haidt talks about the same thing. He calls them weird. Western, educated, individual, uh, um, rich, democratic. Weird. I'm glad, by the way, I'm really glad for some of these comments because, um, you know, I have a lot of ideas for what I'd like to talk about, but it's easy sometimes to get lost in all that. You, you have so many ideas that it's like, holy cow, what am I going to do now? And so this is one of those where, um, you know, seeing things like this or seeing things like the the founders and see the founding of our country, the debate over uh, crypto Catholicism or Newtonian theology, Freemasonry <laughs> Republic, um, that kind of a thing. I, I would love I'd love to host a discussion between Gary North and and uh, Timothy Gordon. I'd love I would love to I'd love to do that. So, you know, thank you, by the way, uh, all of you camo vets. That was a really good one. Jimbo, yeah, Mr. Bannister is right on. I, I don't know what it's about, but I appreciate that. Julian DeMarco, I know so many trad women who are feminist, but yet call themselves traditional. Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't I don't want to get in trouble with all the ladies right now, but it's true. It's true. You know, a lot of trad ladies will call out all the gender bending stuff going on. But if you press them on it and you say, well, let's go back in time and find out when gender bending kind of started and what some of the early symptoms were of this. It was definitely women wearing pants. I, it's not even a question. <laughs> That's not even a question. That's a major thing. That's a major, major historical flip. And it began something way different. The way that women uh, felt about themselves wasn't just independent. It was masculine. That's why, uh, oh my gosh, man, what is his name? Uh, Bernays. Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays, when, when he was talking about, you know, how do you get, um, how do you get people to smoke? How do you get women to smoke? Particularly because the, the cigarette companies were kind of frustrated about it. He said, well, you got to get these ladies in this big parade. And he had the camera set a certain way. He told the media there was going to be some big deal. And there's going to be these beautiful women walking down the street. And at, at a certain time, and they have a uh, torches of freedom was the sign they were holding. And they all pull out some cigarettes and light that cigarette up right when they get up to the thing, right? Right when they get up to the cameras. It was a brilliant optics. All of a sudden, tons of ladies smoking some cigarettes. The idea was to play on it as freedom. But the taboo against it wasn't that women were slaves, but that it was that smoking was actually a more masculine thing. And that them smoking like that was more masculine, which is weird because nowadays a lot of people, even, even Freudian types, I think, would be talking about it as a feminine thing. Either, either which way, either which way, a lot of times the decisions that are being made, and it, this is the last thing I'll say about it. You want, you want to see, you want to see kind of a snapshot of, of what I mean by saying that some some women, even in the trad community, can be talking about you know how they're really feminine and everything else, and that they're against mas you know 
the gender bending stuff and the trans stuff and there's just men and women there's only two sexes and they they let giggle when they watch steven crowder you know in his thing convince me otherwise videos and stuff um but the truth is you start talking to him like uh, kevin samuels talks to black ladies <laughs> you start talking to them and start asking them questions what do you bring to the table what kind of a life do you want? Do you want to have children? How many children? Do you want to live at home? Do you want your husband to work? What are you bringing to the table? Their mentality is modern. They don't understand so many of them, the bubble that they, the, the fishbowl that they're swimming in. And this isn't to diminish women, okay? Because men are the same way. But, you know, we have the same problems with modernity and the way that we're influenced by modernity. And I, I've criticized tr the trad culture in general, saying a lot of it is LARPing. You know, you get these trad folks that sit there and every day, man, they're all they are. They're social media junkies, not reading books anymore. You know, you can use technology. I'm not saying that, that if you use a modern tech, that that's that makes you not traditional. That's, that's be a naive view of technology in general. OK, deeper than just saying social media theory, saying, no, 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 your, your view of technics. It'd be immature to think that way at the same time. So much of the behaviors that men are engaged in now are not masculine whatsoever. Even in, in, in not traditional at all, but it's the draping. So much of it is, you know, so much of it is, but the ambition's still good. I mean, you know, if someone's a, a traditional person and th maybe they're, maybe they're, you know, inspired by the bells and the whistles and the smells, the bells and the smells and all that, that's okay. It's better they're there than not. At the same time, they can't allow that to suffice. You know, if they if they say, I want to be traditional, people really need to actually study what traditionalism is. They do. Offense versus defense. Okay, uh, D's knives. How do we push back or just play defense? We do both. And sometimes our defense is pushing back. Seriously, and sometimes when we push back, that's our defense. You know, you, you, it has to be multifaceted. I, I've said this for a long time. We need to really study. And, I, and, and these are things I want to do kind of documentaries on, right? Uh, a thing called Tactics of Christian Resistance. Uh, Tactics of Christian Resistance. I've compared it to watching Little House on the Prairie. And with Little House on the Prairie, there's an episode. There's an episode of Little House where the, the, the uh, a storm comes in, wipes out the entire farm. Okay, so all the all the the husbands are freaking out. Charles is super depressed. How are they going to make money? How are they going to eat food? And the women they don't know what to do. And it was at that moment, it was at that moment that the wives sat there and realized said, "Wait a second, what about Ruth? What about the threshing floor? There, there's a there's a a way of doing this. We can we can go to old tech because the new the new way that we have to deal with the wheat and everything else." It, we can't use it because the, the, the fields are flattened, but we can go back. And so they did. And they, they, they weren't able to save everything, but they were able to save enough to survive. And it was by going back. So sometimes the tools that we need to focus on might actually not be the tools that we're using right now. Not that we should uh, stop using them. Like, for example, videos. I don't think that we're going to win the culture by videos, by the way. But I believe videos are important in the in the mechanisms, the, the blueprint we have for winning the culture back. It plays a role. It's insufficient by itself, if that makes any sense. But we need to talk about this. We need to, and I'm open to it. I'm, I'm, look, I've got ideas. I've, I've read a lot of books about different views on resistance and what you do in times of crisis and how you, you know, even, even, during times of revival, like how, what are failures of past revivals or ref, times of reform and counter reform? What are failures? What are things that happened that led to some of the problems that we have now? Even it's like one of those road to hell's paved with good intentions. You want to find out more about that? Read Secular Age. Read the book Secular Age by Charles Taylor. That's 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 a church history of good intentions that has led to exactly where we are. With the, with the secularization of the world, making it a more eminent frame, social imaginary being more secular. We're not as porous anymore where the belief of spirits and the transcendent. 
You know, you want to talk about uh, a, a book that details uh, failures in history of great civilizations, controversial book, controversial author, brilliant insights in the book. Not all of them, but it's brilliant. And I think that, that people are, are missing out. Uh, you, you got two of them. You've got uh, Decline of the West. That'd be one, Oswald Spengler. And you would have uh, Francis Parker Yaki, Imperium. Those books detail failures and the reasons why so many places, you could even do fourth turning for that matter. Again, I don't endorse all of the positions in those. At the same time, so many of the insights in that book, you can't get around it. And people aren't reading it anymore. And they're not learning from history, of course. All right, David the Hermit. Oh, dude, I love this guy. He's a regular over at, over at my my channel when we were doing live shows and stuff. He was, he was always in the comments. I love this dude. Uh, God is chastising the world for their acceptance of evil. Totally true, but so many people, uh, modern Catholics included, do not, it doesn't matter if they're trad or not, their social theory sucks. And it doesn't, it's so individualistic. It's so moder it's so infected with modernity, with the rationalism and naturalism of modernity that, that they don't, they don't even see how God judges nations covenantally. And you see this a lot with the people who defend the Constitution, for example, and they don't think it's a problem that there was a no religious test clause in there. <laughs> the significance of that, by the way. The, the idea that it did not specifically address the Trinity, but instead kind of the big G, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, okay, the third one. The new pagan is monotheistic, and the God he worships is the self. If you want to see... If you want to see a really great thing about the worship of the self, I just mentioned uh, uh, Bernay, Edward Bernays. Go watch the documentary, The Century of Self. I think it's what it's called. It's about Bernays. It's about Freud, Freudianism. It's about uh, the influence that that had on our notions of the self and how that has impacted where we are now. It's brilliant. In fact, as it stands, it's still applicable. It's more than relevant. It's necessary watching. Only a couple more comments here again. Make sure, comment comment under this. You might find your, your comment in the uh, upcoming video. We'll find out. We may do more than one because this has gone a lot longer than I anticipated. <laughs> I didn't want to spend like an hour doing this, but I'm going to have to really edit it down and try to just get to the, the nitty gritty, the real good stuff. You know what I'm saying? So Andrea Colombo says, life is too digital nowadays. Sometimes I still put on vinyls on a record player to fly back in time in my youth in the 80s. I, you know, Andrea... You sound like an amazing person. <laughs> I love that. I was just talking to my friend about it. I got to get my, I have a, a record player as well. A turntable. I got uh, a Technic. And it has to get tuned up though. But I have a whole bunch of records and I love it. But, but I want to buy and tell me, I, I want to know, Andrea, tell me, do you listen to vinyl just through speakers? Do you have like kind of those old school speakers? Because I'd love to, I'd love to buy some of those old Macintosh ones in the home, home studios. Those are, my dad had some very, very pricey, but amazing speakers. Um, or do you listen on headphones? And if you do listen on headphones, do you, do you wear open back headphones? Because I want to purchase a pair of open backed headphones, the ones that you can hear the room around you. These are all closed, right? I mean, that's just like metal. These things weigh a ton. <laughs> it goes it goes with the style I feel so I, I've, I've liked it because the style it kind of goes with who I am and stuff but man these things it's like wearing you know it's like wearing a five pound weight on your head I just it's not fun but it, these are close so you you hear nothing I can't hear if people if this microphone's off I can't hear anything you know whereas the open back um, I've listened to those before and boy I oh, I love it I'm not gonna lie I absolutely love it okay uh, Carolina fine says he's like ad rock to the beastie boys oh yes okay it, that's a compliment yes it is i will take that as a compliment <laughs> i'll take it yeah you know you're the first person who's ever said that before i've had i've been compared to some interesting folks i've been compared to some interesting folks so some more realistic than not it bothers me when people are like you're like sean hannity or you're like you're like rush limbaugh i'm like look rush limbaugh if it wasn't for him i wouldn't even have gotten into talk radio from the first place sean hannity <laughs> ben shapiro <laughs> like, okay for the, what the thug life videos five years ago or whatever okay now give me a break 
Give me a break, but Ad Rock, I'll take that. I will take that. I appreciate that, Carolina. Carolina. I appreciate it. All right. Patty Leather says, it's radio. Just worry about the audio and it's gravy. How you look is unimportant. Incorrect, Patty. <laughs> this is not radio. This is not radio. I got a Canon SL3 pointed at me. I got, I have up here, I, people, people don't know this. I have a key light right here. Okay, I got my motivated lighting. You see this? I'm, I'm, I'm sneaky. I'm sneaky. I have a key light right in front of me, a big one. I've got motivated light, which kind of makes it appear. I even changed the color. I have special bulbs to make it appear as though that's what's lighting my face. So the color is similar. Okay. If you can tell, I got my, my lava lamp over there. I got this set up, but I've got it situated in such a way that I don't know if you can tell it's a little blurrier behind me. This isn't as clear as my eyes should be in this. I've also got right here. I have a fill light and sometimes, although not today, I have another light behind me that kind of creates what this light back here is doing, where it kind of lights up the back. It separates me from the scene behind me. Normally I would have that on this side over here. And so it would it would kind of get me out of the shadows, right? Separate me and give, give depth of field to this. All of that is video. This is a different thing. Most people watch this. And so this actually does matter. And it's different. I can tell you that because I've done radio most of my life and it didn't matter. You could, you could, there, there's that, that old phrase, you have a face made for radio. Okay. That's true. You don't know how many hyper obese dudes and hyper obese chicks that I've known in my life who have these amazing voices. It reminds me, it was, you know, I don't know if this is controversial to say on this channel, but Beavis and Butthead, right? Back when I was younger, the nineties. Okay. So Beavis and Butthead, there's an episode, you know, they, they see a number on the screen and they call the number and it's one of those kind of sexy numbers and stuff. And they call that number and the lady answers and she's like, hi, you know, and she's got this super sexy voice and then it shows her and she's in this trailer park looking all sorts of nasty. <laughs> she's super fat, you know, she's farting in her seat and she's surrounded by these guys that are watching like Jerry Springer with chips and stuff and stains all over their shirts and nightgowns and everything. She's got curlers in her hair. Looking like she hasn't shaved or washed herself in like a year. So it is important. It is. Okay. It is well, and it is to me especially, because I take a lot of pride in in media, right? That's what I went to school for. I take a lot of pride in the professionalism of my production. And if it's audio, if it's just, and I have some of those, you can find those in the Paleocrat Diaries. I should create just a, a, a Paleocrat podcast playlist. I should do that. Uh, in fact, I'll do that by the time this episode goes up. So if you go to my website, my YouTube channel over at Paleocrat, it'll be a playlist of just audio and you can hear what I do to my audio uh, because in pre-production or po post-production where it's not, um, it's really smooth. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's real smooth. Uh, sure, 7318 says, I like your style on the show. Please do more. Thank you very much. And I sure will. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. I'm definitely going to be doing more. I'm excited to do more. You know, this is something that, this is a big deal to me. You know, I, I was so happy, to be honest. I was so happy when, when Tim was still cool with having me do that. There was nothing ever wrong between us. We just, I hadn't done anything in a long time. And I'm the one who approached him. I said, dude, I, said, I want to talk to you. And so we did. We talked. And I said, I, I, I'd like to take up your offer from a long time ago to do a show. He was ecstatic. Super pumped. We're excited about it, forward thinking, visionary folks, and we trust God on this, okay? We trust God on it, so I sure will, <laughs> and I appreciate it. I'm glad you like the style of the program. All right, we are coming down to the final, the final two, the final two, and I saved these for last, okay? Because one of them is kind of like one earlier, but one of them here, I, I, I just wanted to say this. This is uh, Christopher Feeney, Father Christopher Feeney. Okay, I didn't know he was a priest when he when he messaged me with this, but I, I found this out later. Okay. He said, Mr. Bannister, I've loved all your content and appearances on Tim Flanders' The Meaning of Catholic. Yet, when I heard your story of coming back to the church, when God broke through and brought your priest back into your family's life during your dear daughter's last days, I wept. I didn't know until that episode that you'd lost a child. Words fail. Gestures fail. Everything fails to express the sorrow and pain that I cannot begin to imagine you feel. At the same time, 
the sheer joy and gratitude I felt when I heard how our Lord himself came back to you. Your witness and example have done so much to help me in my poor excuse of ministry. And you know what? You threw yourself under the bus, Father. You're, you are celebrating the Mass and providing sacraments to people in one of the worst times. It's not, they were, I, I, don't th I still don't think it's the worst. You know, I, I think that there have been times, um, it, sometimes it feels worse because we have access to information that, you know, so we see kind of a preponderance of this all the time. And the mediums we, we rely on are heavily dominated by that sort of a thing. But it is regardless, even if it's not the worst, let's say it's one of the worst times to ever be alive. It's one of the worst times you have tons of people who are wondering, is this the end? And you are providing sacraments. It's not a poor excuse for a ministry. But you know what? I'm glad you're humble. And I'm glad you're listening. And I'm glad you like this song at the end. I'll even play it again <laughs> at the end of this. God bless you, your family, and give glory and the brilliance of eternal splendor to your Sammy. Yes. Forever and ever and ever memory eternal. All right, last one. False syllogism says, this is one of the first of your videos I've seen, but I wanted you to know that through it, I have wept with you, smiled with you, and prayed for you and your loved ones. May God bless you all. I'm grateful. I am grateful. I'm grateful for each and every one of you. I'm grateful for Meaning of Catholic. I'm grateful for Kennedy Hall and the invitation that I had to be on the Crusade channel. Super glad about that. I'm glad that this video is getting posted to Meaning of Catholic. <laughs> I didn't even ask him yet. I know he's gonna do it. I know he's gonna do it. And I'm gonna make more. So, okay, look, hold me to it, everybody. Pray for me, okay? I'm encouraged. You inspire me. You encourage me all the time. Make sure to go over and check out the show and check out the, we've written blogs and other things. I've been a little relaxed on it. I gotta admit, I would even dare say maybe a little bit lazy <laughs> over at paleocratdiaries.com. But I'm getting better at this. I'm getting back in the zone. I found what I believe to be a purpose and a mission. The liturgy of my life, the vocation that God has given me in my life to do my best to give it my all and to help others along the way so that they can do the same, giving glory to God in every single aspect of their life. You can find all that over at paleocraddiaries.com. If you'd like to email me, I'd love to talk to you, okay? You can do that by emailing me either at one or two places, Facebook, or <laughs> Facebook. You can meet me on Facebook, jeremiah.bannister, or same thing at Gmail, jeremiah.bannister at gmail.com, or paleocraddiaries at gmail.com. <sighs> Again, I really appreciate all of you. I ask you to pray for me, for my family, for my mother-in-law, for the repose of my daughter's soul, for my sister who has uh, terminal cancer. If you'd like to know more about that, follow her, Phoebe Davis, on Facebook. I'll see you shortly. <laughs>